Formula One engines won't work upside down. And the first question is probably, why is that important? Well, we're trying to drive a Formula car upside down in a tunnel, which you'll know if you've been following the last few videos in this series. And an F1 car and its engine seem like the obvious choice for this stunt. However, it's not. What would it cost for a new supplier to come in and develop a new engine? They start with numbers like one billion pounds. That's Willem Toa, who's been developing the car for Project Inversion. And he He's just crushed the idea of Driver 61 powertrains being F1's next engine supplier. Now, to be fair, Willem was referring to developing an entirely new powertrain, but even adapting an existing F1 powertrain would likely be impossible. They've been designed with the sole purpose of making F1 fast, not driving upside down. They're so tightly optimised no one's considered what would happen in a situation that is unrealistic. You, you, you allow for very high G, but you've always got that downward component helping. So a Formula One would just not be suitable. So before we explain how we're going to propel our project inversion car, let me quickly run through why an F1 engine isn't right. Well, it's mainly down to controlling the liquids inside the engine. F1 engines and internal combustion engines in general need to be lubricated, fueled and cooled. And annoyingly, these fluids are quite difficult to control. With gravity, the fact they're being put under six Gs of braking and loads of vibrations. But for product inversion, gravity is the main issue. You would need it to be able to cope with running at all angles. So all internal combustion engines run, running in cars, race cars, they can cope with extremely high G but require at least to have some gravitational force pulling fuel, oil, uh, your liquids. Of course, we'll still have gravity acting on the car, but the car will be the wrong way up. F1 cars have dry sumps, whereas normal cars have normal sumps at the bottom of the engine, which is no good in F1, as one, the oil would slosh around too much, and two, the sump would mean the engine would need to be higher, therefore meaning a higher center of gravity not what you want when you're going through the twisty bits of a racetrack. Anyway, you still need to collect the oil and fuel as well to then move it around the engine, which is done via pickup strategically placed around the bottom of the engine and fuel tank. But you can imagine what happens when the car is upside down. All those pickups will no longer pick up oil because the oil will be staying in the head, will be going completely the wrong way. Now, it would be possible to adapt an F1 engine to work for this project, but there's simply no point. It's just too difficult and expensive, and an F1 engine just simply isn't required. So what are the other options? Well, loads of you have commented about motorbikes, stunt plane, and rotary engines in the other videos, but they're still not the best option. First, motorbike engines. Good power to weight and low cost. They're mass produced, they're relatively easy to tune to a good level of performance, and they perform relatively reliably and well. But managing the oil and fuel is still a bit of work, and this would also be the case for rotary engines. The engine itself doesn't care which way up it is, but the systems that move the oil and fuel about do, so they're off the table. But what about an engine that is designed to be used both ways up? Well, we'll get onto that in a second, but first I wanted to explain one of the main reasons the team and I are working on Project Inversion, aside from driving a car upside down just being incredibly cool. But really, it's to inspire the next generation of engineers. Project Inversion is a fascinating technical challenge that wouldn't be possible without the deep knowledge and experience our engineers have built up over decades. Skills are all stem from a deep understanding of science, engineering, technology, and maths. But if you want to do that, where do you start? Well, Project Inversion's partner, Brilliant.org, is the place to begin learning these skills. Check this out, it's Brilliant's course on classical mechanics, and they have lessons based on kinematics. This is why Brilliant is great. It's a short lesson that you can do at lunch, on the train, or anywhere really, but teaches you by doing, with engaging lessons that you can do in your downtime. They have thousands of visual lessons from foundational and advanced maths to AI, data science, real engineering, and more with new lessons added monthly. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org forward slash drive61 or click the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and the rest of this series all about project inversion. So what about that engine that is designed to be used both ways up? An engine specifically designed for a stunt aeroplane will be designed to be able to fly upside down as well as the correct way up 
and it will cope very well. So it'd work. That's a step in the right direction. But we're looking to keep weight to a minimum. Remember, less weight means less speed to drive inverted, and so a shorter and more affordable tunnel. Plus, we're a bit tight on space under the engine cover of the Empire Wraith. So a big, heavy, fuel-guzzling stunt plane motor isn't the right way to go either. And it looked like we were running out of options, or at least affordable ones. But we don't need the power of an F1 car. A Formula 1 car produces about 1,000 horsepower but the top speed of our car only needs to be about 90 miles an hour. So Willems calculated with safety margin that we require about 260 horsepower. That's around 200 kilowatts. So nothing that crazy. And so the sensible option seems to be electric. Batteries and motors just don't care which way up they are. And there are other very important benefits too, which I'll go into in a bit. But my initial concern about using electric was the weight. Remember, we're trying to reduce weight as much as possible, and the battery on something like a Tesla Model S is 550 kilograms. That's more than double the weight of the car we're planning to use. But road car batteries are all about energy efficiency and maximum capacity. As we're all scared, they'll run out and we'll have to spend anything longer than three minutes at Telford service station. To help save us all from this awful possibility, road car batteries are big and heavy and have capacity that we just don't need for project inversion. On the other hand, Formula One car batteries weigh between 20 and 25 kilograms, but they're not quite right either. They're all about power density and the ability to charge and discharge quickly and many times over a race. So their batteries are made up with different chemistries compared to the road cars, whereas we only need it to work once and for a short period. But we do need a decent amount of power and as little weight as possible. Typical weight for the sort of unit that we would need would be maybe 50 kilos for a good battery pack using Formula One technologies. But there are other technologies we can go to that would suit our project well. But that's only the battery. What about the motors? And this is where things get really interesting. Road cars typically have one or two motors of about 300 kilowatts each. Great for when you're speeding away from Telford services. But again, we don't need all of that. Our car is extremely light and we don't actually need to go that fast. And so we only need about 200 kilowatts and we don't want to add weight with extra power that we don't need. Now we could use a single motor, which requires a traditional diff and drive shafts, but that has its own problems. If you use a little bit too much power, one wheel will start to spin, it no longer gives you as big a contribution and the other would give you a yaw mode. Willem describes a yaw moment, which means the rear of the car would be sliding. And I'll be honest, I don't want to have wheel spin and oversteer when I'm about to go upside down. So we need a better solution. Now we're not entirely certain we'll go in this direction, but it does seem like the best option at the moment. And it's one borrowed from Formula Student. My experience actually comes more from high-end Formula Student where four-wheel drive electric motors have been in Formula Student for a long time. These little motors are incredible. They weigh about three kilograms and produce 67 horsepower each. They're so small that they actually fit inside the wheel, which means we can have four-wheel drive. And as an added benefit, there's no annoying differential or drive shafts, adding weight and complexity, as a motor is connected to each individual wheel. This really is a beautiful solution. So the weight has been trimmed down. We've removed the need for oil and fuel sloshing around and missing their pickups. And so the battery and little motors couldn't get any better, right? Well, wrong. Remember in the first video, I spoke about the danger zone, the point at about 135 degrees up the side of the tunnel where the car suspension is all over the place and gravity is trying its hardest to peel the car off the surface and into a crash. Well, the four little motors can help here too through something called torque vectoring. But what exactly does torque vectoring do? You apply different power to different wheels so that the car follows the trajectory requested by the driver. So let's say you turn into a corner and the car is understeering like a pig, then you might apply a little bit of braking to the inside rear wheel, apply more power to the outside, and that's going to uh, add, if you like, a yaw moment to the car that's going to help it to turn in. 
Basically, we'll have individual torque control of each wheel, which is really important. Imagine the car driving up the side of the tunnel. There's lots of change going on with loads through each tire. Basically, how much each tire is being pushed into the surface, which equates to how much grip it has. So first, the corner weights of the car are changing due to the turning and driving across the curvature. And second, gravity is pulling on the car in a different direction. And thirdly, the speed will change slightly, so there's also a change in downforce. So there's a lot going on. And if it were left to a human and a traditional powertrain, it's likely that any or all of the tires would go over the limit so slide or get wheel spin, or be under the limit and not use all of the grip available. But with some clever software and the ability to control each wheel individually, we can sense all these things and adapt each wheel to suit. So if wheel spin was about to occur, which could cause the car to slide and fire itself off the tunnel, the system would adjust the torque going to that individual wheel, and so the tire wouldn't slide. In the last project inversion video, I asked anyone studying or working in motorsport to get in touch. But something was wasn't working properly with the link. I've now fixed it, so please do get in touch, and the new link is in the description below. We're gonna have to build our own tunnel for this project, which is crazy. If you wanna find out why we can't use a normal tunnel and see the plans for the one we've designed, watch this video here, or here's another video I think you'll enjoy. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.